So welcome everyone. Um, this is the second webinar of a series of five. We're very excited for a great session ahead. Uh, and I'm going to pass over to uh, Evie, who is going to be chairing this session uh, today. Thanks, Kerry, and welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Evie Katsapi, and I'm an associate professor in psychology and special education at UCL Institute of Education. I will be chairing today's session, and I'd like to welcome everyone at UCL Penn uh, Global COVID Study Team. So our study is a longitudinal survey looking at the impact of COVID-19 on our mental health, physical health and relationships. So today we are thrilled to present some data uh, to you from this uh, in our second series of the series of five webinars, uh, which are sponsored by UCL Global Engagement Fund. So we always need to remember to say thank you to uh, the financial supporters. Um, so today uh, we will have uh, three parts in the webinar. The first will be a 25 minute presentation from the study team, followed by two 15 minute commentary from um, a discussant with expertise in clinical policy and economics nonprofit roles. And of course, we will end uh, with a QA and a uh, from 6 p.m. onwards. So the goal of this series is uh, for us to share our study findings with the public and, and invite critique and commentaries from you, the audience, but also from leading experts in the industry, clinical practice policy and public health, who are not from our study. So this is to ensure that our research recommendations can be applied to practice. So today I'm really happy to have two very special guests to discuss the study findings. Um, a warm welcome to Dr. Emma Barkus, uh, who is a senior lecturer at Northumbria University, Newcastle upon Tyne in the Department of Psychology. She started at Northumbria University in July 2020 after spending a decade working at the University of Wollongong, Australia, um, long, long way. Um, she gained her undergraduate and doctorate in the UK and completed two postdoctoral positions in the UK prior to moving to Australia. Emma's research is concerned with understanding the mechanisms through which risk factors confer their vulnerability of serious mental health disorders and psychosis in more particular. More recently, she has become interested in the overlap of cognitive resources between working memory and emotion regulation. Emma's research encompassing multiple uh, risk uh, factors such as cannabis, social support, social functioning and loneliness, as well as cognitive and biological markers. Emma's research informs preventative approaches to mental health disorders by elucidating the factors which can be targeted by structured interventions and those that may be amenable to change. So welcome, Emma. Um, and the second very important person I'd like to welcome is Mitch, Mitch Cook, um, who has 30 years experience in the environment and sustainability sector and is the founding director of Green Page Environmental, an independent sustainability and environmental consultancy to the built environment. He is currently an active member on the Enfield Place and Design Review Panel, Barking and Dagenham DRP, and the Essex Design Review Plan, representing sustainability for the councils on relevant schemes within their boroughs. He is also a design council expert looking at how green infrastructure can be integrated into development schemes to deliver better health outcomes, climate resilience, biodiversity, and community value. Uh, Mitch also represented a green page on the NHS Healthy New Towns Advisory Board, part of the UK GBC Social Value Working Team to define social value for developments. So he has a bachelor's of science in ecology, a master's in environmental management and assessment, and he's a chartered environmentalist and a member of the IEEM and IEMA, sustainability board member for British Proper Federation, mentor for Urban Land Institute Future Leaders Program and mentor at the University of Westminster. 
So welcome, Mitch. Uh, all these accolades uh, are putting everyone else to shame, I think. So next we have our study team members, Dr. Kerry Wong, who is an assistant professor of psychology at the UCL Institute of Education and the principal investigator of the UCL Penn Global COVID study. Uh, Kerry trained as a developmental psychologist and criminologist at the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Cambridge. Kerry's research has two strands, one that focuses on understanding how children develop trust and mistrust in others and how this relates to mental health. The second strand is on the causes of crime and schizophrenia spectrum disorders. So loads of interesting um, findings and um, thoughts. So please follow Kerry on her social networks and social media to find out more. Um, and our other um, member of the team is uh, Dr. Wang Yi, uh, who is an associate professor at the Institute of Psychology and um, Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing, China. She received her doctoral degree in cognitive neuroscience and neuropsychology in 2013. And during 2016, 2017, she worked at the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Ch Cambridge as a visiting scholar. Her research is mainly focused on social cognition and relevant brain mechanisms in clinical patients and at risk individuals with schizophrenia spectrum disorders. I will start uh, the first part of the presentation. So for this webinar, looking at how do we trust again, paranoia and mental health, I'll be starting the presentation and then passing the baton on to Dr. Wang Yi, who will tell you the results of our paper. So let's begin. Why are we interested in studying and researching trust? As most of you know on the call, uh, trust is the bedrock of a successful relationship. And arguably, I would say it's very important for our day-to-day -day functioning as well in society. And uh, many times, you know, we may trust others too much and regret it, but sometimes a little, uh, you know, level, a, a reasonable level of mistrust is also um, healthy and that it helps us learn from the relationship and also uh, decide how much to trust others in the future as well. During the global pandemic, and I would argue and say even before the pandemic, trust has really been continually challenged um, at various levels. So at the individual level during the pandemic, we've been forced to socially distance or physically distance, uh, most of us would like to say. Um, we've also had to question our authority and institutions, governments also in some uh, cases on how they've handled the COVID pandemic. Um, and at a more global level, how uh, countries have been managing the whole pandemic um, and the um, division of vaccines, that has also involved a lot of trust as well as mistrust. So the topic of trust really has uh, lots of importance, both at the public health uh, level, but um, in our day-to-day -day relationships as well. And this area of research is of concern for a lot of researchers, um, myself included and others as well, um, where we are interested in those who are highly mistrustful um, and the idea of excess social mistrust coming into play into our daily lives to the level of um, what we call paranoia. So paranoia is the unfounded fixed belief that others are out to cause intentional harm. So that's a mouthful, but I'll unpack this a little bit. When we say unfounded fixed beliefs, these are um, ideas that uh, are unchangeable. And oftentimes when, even when the individual is presented with alternative explanations, um, they are still pretty much holding on to their beliefs and don't want to change their ideas about someone or something. Um, but the important point here about paranoia is, is that these beliefs and ideas about others are harmful. They think that uh, there's a persecutory nature to these ideas and beliefs. And you can imagine if you are, you know, going through life and thinking this way all the time, that can have serious uh, impacts on your day-to-day -day functioning, and it can be quite harmful if it is persistent and sustained over time. And so the rationale for this particular study and the paper uh, really is, uh, you know, stems from the idea of coronavirus being this invisible killer 
um, right? So we don't really, we can't see it um, out in the open. Um, and we don't know whom to trust early in terms of whether or not they are positive, uh, tested positive, or whether they've even um, had their vaccines, et cetera. And so you can imagine um, that perhaps paranoia may also um, be uh, instilled in us more so these days due, due to the coronavirus and the pandemic. And so from existing research, we know that paranoia impairs our functioning. And there's a lot, there are many studies showing that it's linked to poor mental health, including uh, anxiety, depression, more uh, rumination and worries as well. It's also been linked to poor physical health, including individuals having higher blood pressure, heart problems, and even social, with, uh, social withdrawal. Um, from um, physical uh, social situations with others, simply because they're fearful of leaving the house in some cases. And of course, these are extreme cases at the, at the very extreme end. Um, we know that research uh, has also shown that paranoia and mistrust lie on a continuum of severity. So not every paranoid thought is um, very serious, um, but some of them can be very serious and hostile and are what we often say conspiracy theories as well. So on the graph on the right, you can see this kind of positive uh, skewed curve, as we call it. Um, what it's trying to show you is that majority of the people in the general population, they would maybe endorse zero to one or two of these paranoid thoughts. But a small proportion of the general population actually are scoring and endorsing many of these thoughts. And they're saying that it's very frequent and severe. And that's the kind of population that we're most concerned about because they are more likely to uh, suffer from poor mental health and physical health over time. In fact, paranoia is a key symptom of schizophrenia and also schizophrenia spectrum disorders. And so one of the uh, uh, symptoms that or personality disorders that we've measured in our study is called schizotypal personality. And you've guessed it, right? Because schizotypal sounds a lot like schizophrenia simply because it shares a lot of the similar um, symptoms of schizophrenia, um, but you can think of it as, a, as at a, a milder level. So the symptoms um, kind of can be classified into three dimensions, cognitive perceptual anomalies, interpersonal deficits, as well as disorganized thoughts. And what, what these three dimensions uh, really are trying to capture are, are the bullet points listed here um, below. Uh, these individuals often express uh, peculiar, eccentric, or unusual thinking and perceptions. So perhaps seeing things that no one else can see or hearing things that no one else can hear. They report uh, being suspicious and paranoid. They report magical thinking and superstitions, believing that they themselves have special powers. Um, and also blunted affect and odd mannerisms. So that affects their kind of interpersonal relationships. So in our uh, UCL Penn Global COVID study, we tried to measure um, levels of mistrust in, the, in our sample, but also um, features of schizotypal personality, because we're really concerned or interested in understanding whether or not this might uh, change or increase as a result of the COVID pandemic. So this study really is a collaboration across five institutions. And we have a really large team uh, spanning different countries as, you, as illustrated here. And I'd like to uh, draw your attention to the, our social media up top on the right as well, as well as the Open Science Framework page where you can find out more information about the study. And I know those of you, about half of you on the call may have taken part in our study as well. So you'll be familiar with a lot of what I'm gonna say in the next two slides. But uh, for those of you who, who are not familiar, here's just a summary of the study. Uh, the study involves three 30 minute online surveys that were available in eight different languages. We administered in, uh, these surveys across a 12 month period. So the first wave, which coincided with the UK lockdown, first lockdown, last April till July 2020. And then six months after we launched our second survey, which coincided with the UK lockdown too, um, between October and January. And then six months after that, which is now the 12 month follow up, and that's still happening. That is coinciding with a lot of the UK uh, easing of lockdown as well. And so um, we'll be presenting some data from all three of these waves today.
Just to continue, in the survey, we asked uh, many things, including mental health things, uh, physical activity, as well as uh, relationship quality, paranoia, empathy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can find out more on our uh, Open Science Framework website at the uh, upper right corner. Um, and just to summarize who actually participated. So from wave one, we had over 2000 people take part um, and most of them were from the UK, from the US, Greece, and also Italy. 54% of them were under the age of 34, even though uh, most of our, uh, all of our participants range, uh, age, ages range from 18 to 89. 45% um, reported that they were single, 39% said they had, um, they hold a master's degree or a bachelor's degree, and about 50% um, earned 40,000 uh, pounds a year, um, with most of these participants being female as well, so 70% um, were uh, female. In wave two, we followed up uh, the same group of participants, and this time 1,200 of them continued to support our study, so we're really thankful. We also had new people join this wave of, of uh, the study, about 500, and as you can see, uh, the, the um, uh, respondents are not that different to the first wave. Um, relatively speaking, there were more people from the UK, um, but fewer from, the, uh, from Greece and Italy. And finally, in wave three, we'll be presenting about 700 and, and or so uh, data points today. Um, but most of them, again, are, are from the UK, continuing to support us, the US, uh, Italy as well. Um, and so with that said, I'm going to next move on to what did we actually find? So first off, I'm going to list, I guess, the questions of our study. Uh, we had kind of three questions going into this, uh, this study. Um, the first is whether or not social mistrust and schizotypy um, are related to poor mental health. And the second being, are the relationships between variables, uh, between these variables the same across both men and women, those in the younger category versus older, those in the UK versus other countries, different income patterns, as well as uh, across the lockdown periods. And then finally, the third question is whether, you know, when we map out these relationships, is it the same for those who are highly paranoid or low, low on paranoid uh, thoughts, as well as uh, schizotypal traits? Um, and before I uh, pass on the presentation to uh, Dr. Wang Yi, I'd like to um, ask you guys um, a poll, uh, some questions, um, because I'm no longer uh, the host, um, if I can get the host to launch uh, poll number three, um, that would be great. So if I can get, or the moderator to do that. Okay, perfect. Thank you for launching the poll. So this is before we present our study findings to you. We'd like to just see how, you know, how lockdown has been for you, for those of you who've experienced national lockdowns, um, but also how uh, trusting you are perhaps of others um, as a result of the COVID pandemic. Okay, so I hope all of you can see the poll now. So just go with your uh, gut feeling, don't overthink it. Um, and let's see what, we can, um, how everyone is faring on these questions. So about 90% of you have voted now, and I think um, we can share the results. Um, all right, so it looks like most, uh, for most people, the COVID pandemic hasn't uh, made you more or less trusting of other people around you, so it's unchanged. Some say that they are less trusting, others are, uh, oh, a few more trusting too, and uh, some are unsure. Uh, most of the people on the call seem to have found lockdown one to be the most challenging, perhaps, but uh, quite a good number for lockdown two and three, so I guess it varies a bit. Um, and then finally, this is just out of curiosity, um, whether people feel like that an, another national lockdown might be unbearable. Um, but I'm glad to glad to know that most people say they'll manage. Great. So I'll now pass the uh, baton on to Dr. Wang Yi. Wang Yi, are you able to present our findings? Yes. Yeah. 
Yes, sure. Thanks. So let's see the results. The first question is social is social mistrust or schizotypy related to poor mental health, right? Mm -hmm. The answer is yes. As you can see, we use the network approach. You can see here actually uh, connected with each other. The nodes are the, the variables in blue. They are schizotypy and social mistrust. Mm -hmm. And the uh, uh, variables in orange, they are loneliness or aggression or something like uh, other mental health variables, anxiety, depression, something like that. So you can see here the lines between uh, nodes between the variables shows they have uh, positive correlations. And uh, you can see the connections between like loneliness and interpersonal, which is the schizotypy are uh, quite strong, right? It's 0.44. So it shows, it actually shows the connections or strong correlations between uh, mistrust or schizotypy and poor mental health here, right? And uh, if we move to this question that are the relationships between variables the same across gender, age, countries or something. And uh, we actually found there are no significantly uh, differences between like gender or uh, age groups or countries like UK versus others countries. And no matter you are like uh, have low or medium or high income levels, you have uh, people that have uh, having uh, similar networks. So um, this network is quite similar across different people. Then how about the UK lockdowns? I'll say the waves. So we have three waves, right? You can see um, here, so at the first wave, to the next, to the uh, second one, at uh, wave two, yes, uh, people reported actually more severe um, sleep problems, and uh, people also reported, uh, but is a lower level of schizotypy and aggression, and uh, at you can see as wave three they have like a further reduction of schizotypy, social mistrust, aggression, and stress because the wave three is actually the easing stage, right? So it's quite make, uh, reasonable. Although you can, uh, we found, we actually found significant uh, differences at three waves, like across three waves on this schizotypy, mistrust, or uh, mental health, but actually, uh, in terms of the network structure, we didn't find significant changes. So you can see here, although we see minor changes in terms of the links or the lines between these variables, but we did the network compa comparison and they didn't show uh, significant changes in terms of the network structure which indicate that these uh, connections or the correlations between variables, I'll say um, mental health and the schizotypy or mental health and uh, uh, mistrust, they are uh, quite same across three waves. And the last question is, uh, we, we are interested in the um, network structure for high and low schizotypy individuals? So the answer is no, the, they are different. So you can see here for high schizotypal individuals, there are uh, strong connections between variables, especially for this um, connections between social mistrust and the cognitive perceptual dimension of, schiz uh, of schizotypy. And you can also see a stronger link between loneliness and schizotypy. It shows that the high schizotypy in uh, a group, they do show a stronger 
network or stronger connections of these variables. And uh, next we did actually the high and low mistrust groups. So we uh, repeat the uh, network comparison and this result is similar to the high and low schizotypy groups. So you can see uh, individuals with high social mistrust, they do have a stronger connect connected uh, network. So uh, similarly, they showed a stronger connection between social mistrust and the uh, schizotypy. And they showed like a uh, strong connection between schizotypy and anxiety as well. Okay, so in summary, we did find higher like uh, mistrust or higher level of schizotypy is related to poor mental health. And the second question is, we didn't find uh, significant differences between different groups, which means our network is quite same across different uh, groups. And the most interesting uh, thing is we did find significant differences between high and low trust, uh, mistrust levels of uh, people. So, uh, but you can see here the loneliness is very interesting uh, variable. We are um, uh, actually uh, this node is, uh, this variable is uh, very influential in the network because it connected uh, three, at least two, three very important variables we, we are interested, including schizotypy, social mistrust, and uh, uh, depression. And uh, this uh, loneliness may play a very important role in the whole network. Um, so we are going to uh, let Carrie to give us a summary of this result. Great, thank you, Wang Yi, very clear. Um, and so basically what does all of this mean, right? Um, we in this paper tried for the one of the first times to map out all the variables that, are, that we've measured about mental health. And in addition, we've measured things related to social mistrust and paranoia to see how these things are related. And during a time of COVID pandemic, whether these relationships may be stronger for different groups. Um, even though this was a novel uh, technique to understand um, and map all the variables holistically, we didn't find unique networks for specific groups. Um, what we did find, as uh, Wang Yi said, um, were, was that the connections for those who are highly mistrustful or had more schizotypal traits, those connections tended to be stronger, meaning that individuals who um, were more mistrustful, they, they were also reporting higher levels of anxiety, loneliness, uh, aggression, as well as depression. And one thing that really came through in this in our findings is loneliness being a very influential variable in this network. So imagine being, you know, almost like the uh, influential um, YouTube star, right? If they say something, everyone listens. So that's influence. Similarly, loneliness, uh, these perceived uh, loneliness levels are what people are telling us when they are highly mistrustful and also highly um, uh, schizotypal. Um, and so when we uh, dig deeper into understanding, well, actually, what do we know about loneliness? Can we reduce levels of loneliness for people? Um, we might uh, suggest from based on our findings that intervention to reduce loneliness may help improve both social trust and mental health moving forward and moving out of the pandemic. Um, this finding is consistent with other COVID studies out there that we know of um, that are listed here on, on the page. Uh, where individuals or a population um, is reporting between five to 7% of, of increases in levels of loneliness between wave one and wave two, but they haven't reported um, data on the easing of lockdown, which we have um, to show that levels of loneliness perhaps may um, change for, for, perhaps for some groups as well. Um, and so with that said, I'm going to now um, let uh, Emma take the lead in um, critiquing our studies and commenting uh, on our study findings. 
Thank you very much, uh, Kerry, and you for the presentation you've just given with these really interesting results. And thank you very much for the uh, very generous introduction, Evie, and the invitation to be here today. So I've just got a few slides to talk about some of the implications of COVID to provide a bit of context for the results that Kerry and you have talked about. So it may seem like a distant memory to many people now, but the fire season which took place over the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020 in Australia was particularly severe. In fact, so severe it was actually named Black Summer after the fact. Now between October 2019 and the end of March 2020, an area about the size of Syria was set ablaze in Australia. And these fires burnt so hot and with such ferocity that many of them were actually left to be contained and burn out rather than people actually being able to put them out. Round about 80% in people of us in Australia living there at the time were either directly or indirectly affected by these fires and media outlets both nationally and internationally presented amazing and breathtaking photographs of skies filled with smoke and red flames. What was also very present in the media throughout both the national and international press was the human face of these fires within Australia. The human cost was counted in national headlines and internationally too. People lost their homes, their livelihoods, their businesses, settlements were destroyed and devastated by these fires. But alongside this, people opened up their homes, their hearts and communities came together to support people who had lost. And out of it came a sense of, a sense of hope and regeneration. There was also another force of nature that was uncontrollable brewing from January 2020, and this was COVID. Now, unlike a fire front, COVID didn't present something we could face head on. It didn't present something a community, a nation, or a world could get behind and face straight on in the same way as we can with a fire. It wasn't something we could see. It didn't have a face to it. Instead, it crept into countries around the world through our travel and our commercial routes. And in fact, the degree to which the world has expanded and become more connected actually worked against us with COVID. So what has happened over time is that boundaries between different countries and nations have been reaffirmed. We've all become much more having that sense of distance and separateness from one another. The only place that has seemed safe is home. Unlike with the fires, the media outlets have jumped on the frenzy of COVID and fed the fear, panic and uncertainty that COVID has presented us. Nationally and internationally, nationally, we tend to see media headlines that contain inaccurate or misinformation or very loaded language. And often these headlines can be contradicted within the same news cycle. So rather than trying to present a face of affirming people and affirming the sense of connections we need to maintain to fight the consequences of COVID, the press has very much um, fed the fear and anxiety that people have felt. So a group of researchers led by Aslam in the middle of 2020 published a paper where they analysed the headlines from 25 English speaking media sources from the period of the middle of January through to the beginning of June. And what they found was that over 50% of these headlines 
actually carried a negative connotation to them. And the, the emotions that were most likely to be evoked were fear, sadness, and anger. So you can see here how the press is very much fed that sense of uncertainty and encouraged a sense of mistrust in others. Although it's interesting to see from the poll that was done earlier that this hasn't translated through to a subjective sense of mistrust in many of you. So under these sorts of conditions, the stable individual difference factors that we all have, like our personality, become very important for understanding the consequences of what's taking place. In a time where everything outside of us is incredibly uncertain and full of a mass of information that we have to work our way through in order to gain any sense of understanding, it comes down to the individuals, their sense of self and their resources to determine the physical and mental health consequences of the current circumstances. Prior to the pandemic occurring, there had been a growing interest in research on loneliness. And people were talking about an epidemic for the levels of loneliness that was occurring in Western countries. And certainly given the physical distancing and in some case social distancing measures that have been required in order for people to remain safe under COVID, there's been a renewed interest in trying to understand the factors that are involved in underpinning loneliness and its consequences. So what is loneliness? As you heard Kerry explain, loneliness is this subjective sense of social disconnect. It means that in some ways we aren't feeling as though we, we are connected meaningfully to people around us. This isn't necessarily about the number of friends you have or the number of people around you. It's about how um, emotionally and psychologically connected you feel to those people in your environment. And it doesn't necessarily have to be your immediate environment. It can be people you keep in touch with through remote means. Now, there are a number of different theories as to why loneliness exists as an emotion. And certainly one of the longest prevailing one is the evolutionary theory, which suggests that we've evolved feelings of loneliness because it's an adverse state. And when it occurs, we're naturally inclined to want to seek out others and regain that sense of social connection. Because as individuals, we're relatively vulnerable, but if we are part of a community or a tribe, we come from a position of strength and we're much more likely to survive from a pragmatic perspective. However, this provides a great explanation of how loneliness might occur as a transitory emotion. So something that occurs for a very short period of time, we do something to change our environment and then it goes away. On the other hand, loneliness can actually become quite chronic. You could almost think of loneliness as becoming a part of somebody's personality, a part of a temperament, a part of who they are. We have this saying that an Englishman's home in, is his castle, but castle walls are high and they don't just keep out threats, they can potentially keep out opportunities for positive experiences. Under instances where we have a long period of time, where we have that sense of being separate from those around us. It presents an opportunity for less helpful ways of thinking about the world to kick in. And some of these lines of thought can be about emphasizing what is different about you as compared to everybody else. And this may, might make it less likely that you will seek out the company of others and much more likely that you will see people around you as threatening in some way. And obviously the current situation with COVID, with 
all the complications around people's vaccines decisions, whether people may have COVID and be asymptomatic, increase that sense of anxiety and unease and may make it much harder for some people to want to take that step and approach others. And again, this is where personality factors start to feed in. Our personality is what shapes our patterns of thinking, the likelihood we might go down particular thought processes. So there is the potential that personality elements like schizotypy could lead people to be more vulnerable for feeling lonely. So just to remind you of some of the key elements of the results that were outlined by Kerry and you. They talked about these different characteristics that we see in schizotypal personality traits. So we have those unu unusual experiences and thoughts. There's an element that captures the way in which people's thinking or their behavior is organized. And there's also another contribution that comes from the ways in which people interact with their social environment, such as a heightened level of social anxiety and suspiciousness. Now, what the first level of results that they presented demonstrated was that when we look at how these schizotypal traits are related to each other, they seem to operate through loneliness before then connecting to the so psychological consequences of that sense of separateness. And if you're somebody who's vulnerable to those unusual experiences and thoughts, you are more likely to feel mistrustful of others. And this is where there's then that double connection through to loneliness and anxiety, okay? So what about those individuals who have higher levels of these schizotypal traits already? Here we start to see how the different components of this complex personality trait potentially separate out a little bit, okay? But not much because a convergence point within this analysis is still loneliness. So whilst we see unusual experiences and thoughts, organization of thinking and behavior and those interpersonal elements seemingly operating independently of one another, they all converge on either social mistrust or loneliness as an endpoint before those psychological vulnerability factors of anxiety and depression. So loneliness is really operating as a hub across the sample as a whole. And if you're somebody who expresses schizotypal traits, you may be much more vulnerable to these feelings of disconnect from people in your social environment. So what do we know about these associations between schizotypal traits and loneliness? So certainly it seems that certain elements of personality have the possibility to leave people feeling more vulnerable to being lonely and separate from those around them. Potentially, if you're more concerned about others or if you perceive others as more of a threat to yourself in some way and you're suspicious of them, you could again be at a heightened risk of loneliness which presents what we might think of as a cycle, okay? If you're lonely and it increases your sense of mistrust of others, you are less likely to seek out others in your environment and alleviate that sense of loneliness. So that social separation and the mistrust can feed one another to maintain an individual's separateness from those around them. And that might be where loneliness can move from being a transitory experience in the moment through to becoming something that's more chronic and ultimately affecting people's physical and mental health. So the less contact we have with other people in our environment, the less likely it is that the fears that we have of people around us can be 
tested, proved to be incorrect, hopefully, and to gain back that sense of meaningful connection. So the question is, what do we need to know next so that we can do something to help these individuals who might be prone to being particularly mistrustful of those around them? Okay. So one of the questions we need to answer is understanding different types of beliefs. So when we're talking about unusual experiences and unusual beliefs, it's encompassing a wide range of unusual beliefs which might be slightly outside social norms. So a PhD student of mine, Al Coleman, is actually considering exactly this. And from the work that she's done so far, it does seem as though it's those individuals who are more likely to feel paranoid that have cognitive lines of thought in place that seem to maintain and perpetuate high levels of anxiety. And this, of course, we know is not good for our long term psychological well being. Through this talk and also through Kerry's presentation, we've emphasized this idea that loneliness is subjective. It's something that's internal to us. So it can become a part of a sense of who we are. So one of the ways in which we need to try and um, help people who want to make meaningful connections with others is through strengthening their sense of self so they don't perceive their connections with other people as a threat. And another student of mine, Cherie Blanche, is considering exactly this question to try and get a handle on whether we can increase people's sense of self-concept in order to improve their overall levels of social connection. Now, in the context that we're in at the moment, there is a degree of change that we don't have control over ourselves. And as humans, this can be a, a very difficult situation for us. Believe it or not, we all are control freaks to a lesser or greater extent. We like to be able to exert control over ourselves and our environment. So we have this construct that's called effective forecasting, which allows us to try and predict how we think we will feel in the future. So when there's talk about another lockdown coming, often we start awfulizing the situation and thinking about how terrible it is going to feel and how awful we will feel when that happens. The reality is we aren't very good at predicting our emotions and that in, if anything, we tend to overestimate the impact an event will have on our day-to-day -day well-being. And perhaps we need to start to educate people that the control over their sense of well-being actually lies within themselves rather than in the events taking place around them. And this is some work that I'm currently engaging in and I've just got the second phase of a study underway on. So you can see from the way I've talked in the last few minutes that there are actually multiple ways in which we can intervene to help people who might have higher levels of social mistrust or higher levels of loneliness. It is interesting, we often assume that people who are lonely don't have many people in their environment and that if we introduce lonely people to others, they will somehow become less lonely. This doesn't seem to be the case. And in fact, loneliness is not fixed by introductions to others. What needs to happen is that sense of connection to someone. So we need to find ways of encouraging and engendering meaningful interactions to take place, okay? And that can happen through multiple different routes. Something else we need to start getting out there and helping people to understand is that actually mistrust and suspiciousness come from a place of fear or anxiety. When we perceive something in, in our environment as a threat, we become distrustful. 
because it feels as though we be, are being attacked internally from something outside of ourselves. So we need to understand this for ourselves, from our own perspective for how we interact with others, but we also need to be aware of it in interactions we have with others so we don't respond negatively to somebody else's mistrust and suspiciousness and instead come from a place of reassuring them that things are consistent and they don't need to be anxious and fearful. And certainly going back to some of the themes I talked about at the beginning, one of the things that has come out of COVID is that it has been politicized to try and divide people back into different nations and different countries. And a strong attempt has been made to politicize even different variants of it. Instead of this, what we actually need to realize is we have much more in common within the, with people across the world than we do differences we are all in the same situation. And we need to understand these commonalities in order to start to build those sense, senses of connection again once more. So I'd like to thank everybody for their time. And I have finished my presentation. So I think I need to hand back to Kerry. Thank you very much, Emma, that was fantastic. But without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Mitch and I'll be doing the slides. So uh, Mitch, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. And again, thank you for the, inter in, uh, the introduction. I think it's a very grand uh, introduction. Um, so my slides are a quick run through on how we as practitioners and consultants in the built environment look at how we can firstly identify what I would call social issues within the community or an area where a new development is being located, and then how we can design uh, and provide layouts and, and indicate performance of buildings and how spaces can work to address some of those issues. So I think it's probably important just to, to, to have this slide and, and in the context of delivering betterment for uh, communities, it's often captured in the phrase which is called social value. But it's probably also uh, worthwhile recognizing that social value means many things to many people. And we look at it in the context of actually providing a community improvement or a betterment in terms of health outcomes or education outcomes for people that live, work and play in around developments. And the, the problem that we encounter in the built environment is that often uh, social value community betterment is couched in sustainability terms. Um, and often it's the poor relation, the insustainability. And what I mean by that is there are standard sustainability reports that are submitted with a planning application, but many of those don't really identify or pick up on what's required to improve certain aspects. And so the three areas we are now seeing being requested or provided as part of that planning process identified in blue. So health impact assessment, social value statements and inequalities impact assessments. But these are still relatively new in terms of requirements and in the way that they're being looked at. Unfortunately, also some of those measures are also quite quantifiable and they look at um, financial proxies for what actually social value is. And that also things like apprenticeships or number of new jobs or kind of economic benefit. What it doesn't do is really capture the value it creates for communities. And what I mean, what I mean by that is going back to what Emma was talking about, there's the interactions and meaningful interactions and what that can actually deliver for people that live in those areas. And so our input is really based on the spaces between the buildings and how we can create those places to create those opportunities or provide those opportunities to address local issues that are seen in either local population dynamics or community um, profiles. And this might be around things like low levels of physical activity or loneliness measures or things like childhood obesity or high level of mental health problems. So how do we actually do that in the work that we, um, that we provide support on? There is quite a lot of good guidance already out there for people in my space. Um, and this is a, a diagram that shows uh, what's considered to be a healthy community and those themes or activities that are, are needed to create 
those meaningful connections and those meaningful interactions, but also things that um, uh, that can be created and, and brought together in a kind of multifunctional green space or what I call green infrastructure. And the diagram really captures this advice from a range of different organisations, um, be that Sports England, Active Design Principles, or Transport for London, Healthy Streets, or some of the UK GBC, Green Building Council advice um, and documents that we've been part of. And a number of things will be really familiar to people that live in areas that have good incidences of these design uh, interventions, you know, for green spaces, connectivity, active lifestyles, art and culture, uh, uh, education, resilience. And this is just really some of them, a bit more detail of um, Sport England's active design checklist. And some of these things are quite specific. And so our role is really identifying a framework by which design uh, master plans and um, development principles can be brought forward to ensure that these are captured. And our role is often about um, creating workshops or having workshop with, the, with design team members so that these factors are firstly understood and secondly then designed in. And so what I wanted to do here was, is to show that whilst we have these great design principles, they really need to be focused um, both in terms of what will create meaningful opportunities for interactions uh, and therefore to address particular aspects within the um, health profiles or socioeconomic profiles of the community. And this is an output from one of the data sets that we look at from the Office of National Statistics, which, which identifies um, indices of multiple deprivation and some of the underlying issues that show why that particular ward area or that um, social, social, uh, socioeconomic profile area has that particular problem. And then knowing that and knowing as to whether that is at the edge of the particular development or um, elsewhere, we can look at how we may through intervention into the design process address some of those aspects. This is one of the projects that we're working on at the moment in the early stage. And this is what we have done to identify some of those underlying social value issues. And you can see that unemployment income is really quite poor in this area of the old Kent Road. Um, you can also see that uh, you know, looking a bit deep, uh, deeper in other indices that things like um, childhood obesity uh, and poor health is also a particular issue. Now they all come together um, uh, as aspects that, that can be addressed through good design. Uh, and things like uh, uh, high level, so income levels being of low, low in the, in the national context, and uh, levels of employment also being low, it means there's a, a propensity of kind of mental health issues associated with concern and um, anxiety. But also things like uh, child obesity can also be uh, addressed through designing spaces that would encourage active design and places where you might get that meaningful intergenerational mixing and areas of playhood, uh, childhood play that only addresses things like loneliness, but also addresses some of those other indices of deprivation and, and uh, issues in the social profile, you know, like over, uh, overweightness and obesity, uh, um, childhood obesity. And this is what we are now producing as an output of, from understanding that baseline. So we're early on in that design process. The Old Kent Road is a mixed use uh, redevelopment um, to create a new destination uh, in an area that's predominantly quite industrial, but now is being repurposed for a mixed use residential education and um, retail center. So the idea being that it will create not only housing, but it will create opportunities for people to, to work um, areas of uh, learning. Uh, and it's therefore important to ensure that the community that are currently there and the new community that are coming together uh, coexist and that there's a community benefit associated with the scheme coming forward for people that work there already or live there already, but also for the people that are going to live there into the future. And these are the kind of the key outputs that we're looking for uh, or, or aiming to deliver in the early, you know, in, uh, in our involvement in that particular scheme. And this is a scheme we've been involved with for a number of years. It's uh, Clapham Park um, Estates in South London. And if people know that area, it's a quite a large estate. Um, is around two and a half thousand new homes coming forward uh, and we've been working with uh, Metropolitan Housing Trust to re-provide good quality housing for the existing residents there but also to provide an opportunity to create spaces that 
um, promote and address some of the issues that are, are seen in the wider community. So again, you know, high levels in activity, uh, there's quite a lot of disconnect of communities from from uh, adjacent to the to the scheme. The idea being is that there are elements to uh, the scheme that will promote that integration. So again, I've indicated in the right hand uh, area of the slide what constitutes a healthy community and that connectivity is an important part of that um, community cohesion. Uh, but also this diagram shows how pedestrian circulation is priori prioritized across the site. It provides that connectivity, but also addresses uh, low levels of, of physical activity in the area. So again, addresses um, or aims to address uh, good health outcomes. And this I think shows again, uh, a propensity for, for active travel as opposed to reliance upon uh, the motor car, which only not only delivers poor air quality, which is a an impact or a poor impact uh, on, on health profiles, but also encourages to be more people to be more active throughout the screen, the scheme. So it uh, connects existing cycleways and and in the previous slide pedestrian ways. So it encourages people to move through the the, the site, but also people within the site to get on their bikes and uh, connect to existing um, cycle superhighways. Um, and again, uh, this shows how that central theme integrates elements around fitness. So not only does it provide opportunities for connectivity throughout uh, and into other communities and, and neighborhoods outside the, the development footprint, but also for people to use the central park for fitness. Uh, next slide, please. And you'll also see then that there are um, within that central park opportunities to provide kind of grow, uh, food production or local uh, local food production or local food growing. Um, as a bit of background, when we were doing the community mapping for this particular area, there was a long, uh, a, a very strong community of um, com uh, allotment and food growers, but they were very isolated. And what we we're aiming to do in this was to bring people in um, and connect with existing allotment and food production areas and community uh, action groups outside the site, but also to enable them to, to come in and interact with new residents in the site as well. And I think this is the last one where actually um, this goes back to the, the principles of, of creating multifunctional spaces. So not only do you have opportunities for people to dwell, but you've also got areas which are dedicated to uh, dedicated play. So again, bringing um, forward opportunities for multi uh, uh, multifunctional space, but also for intergenerational mixing and for people to have that reason to come together. But the problem I think that, that we have as an industry is that there's, there's quite a lot of evolving design principles. Um, and there is also quite a lot of uh, 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 information and evidence base, which uh, we, we don't see because unfortunately there are a number of kind of profession silos that separate us from other practitioners. And so one of the things that we are doing or trying to do is, is work across those silos and work and get an evidence base through empirical data that shows how these design interventions relate specifically to um, betterment in terms of things like Alzheimer's or uh, uh, mental health or loneliness, which is that the, the, the other challenge that we have and if, um, uh, that we're being honest about this is much of the the design advice uh, requires an ongoing monitoring to ensure that those design interventions actually deliver the design outcomes that we were looking for. Um, and the Old Kent Road is probably one of the first of those that I know of where we're doing a um, pre and post occupancy evaluation so that the, the community can can feed back to us their expectation of what it of the social value and betterment that the design for that scheme can deliver for them, but also in, we will go back in future years to see that that those design interventions are actually delivering both the personal uh, experience, so what people are actually seeing, but also that it gives us the opportunity to revisit some of the ONS data to ensure that the design interventions are having those wider benefits for things like uh, high levels of inactivity, High levels of childhood obesity. So as I said, that's a very um, quick run through the uh, the areas that I'm involved in. Um, as I said, it's it's an evolving uh, area where we're looking to collaborate and um, work across silos. So I'm really pleased that we're able to provide our practitioner 
examples in the context of the, uh, the, 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 the evidence base that Kerry and the rest of the team have um, been talking through. Great, fantastic. Thank you so much, Mitch, for a great presentation. Um, I'm sure many, there might even be questions uh, now in the chat. So I'm just gonna uh, let people maybe pop in the chat if they have any questions for Mitch and the rest of the panelists, myself included. Um, give you all a couple of minutes. And as this, as people are thinking of questions, I'll pass back over to Evie. Thank you, everyone, uh, for I don't know how you keep your cool talkers and uh, speakers of this, uh, but well done. Very, very interesting presentations. Thank you. Um, now, as part of the um, webinar series, we're on a social media challenge inviting the public to submit a photo or a video uh, of a place that brightens your mood to fit with today's topic. So we're happy to congratulate Harry uh, at Mellow Matters on Twitter, uh, who has now won an Amazon voucher for his submission of the old D-side railway line in Aberdeen, Scotland. So not sure if um, they are on the call, but yeah, would like to congratulate them. Now, there is one question on the chat um, for Mitch. And uh, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll just go for that, Mitch, and then you can answer. Uh, the question is, there is a move to make areas mixed, residential, business, and retail. Do you think that this will help to create connections within communities? And uh, from stopping areas being too quiet outside of business hours to decrease Absolutely. I, I absolutely uh, think there is a real value in creating places where people can work very close to where they can take their kids to school or where they live for a number of reasons. It, it, it provides more interactions and meaningful interactions. So the more you see your neighbours, the more likely that there is that, that opportunity for meaningful connections. Um, and I think that that's really important. The other thing is that um, there had been a move to kind of separate residential and um, kind of retail areas and business areas and it does create those opportunity or it does create those issues where you do get um, a lack of activity and, and, and natural surveillance around certain locations so the more activity you can get in spaces um, the more natural surveillance you can have um, it, it does address, address some of those uh, uh, problems that arise in in spaces that aren't overlooked uh, on, a, on a frequent basis um, and, and so there has been a move in recent years in planning policy to encourage and retain uh, some of those commercial uses on site um, and acknowledge that there is a way of coexisting and having those uh, a range of um, a range of uh, land uses together. Brilliant, thank you very much. And do you feel that um, COVID has affected your industry? I think it's made people, the short answer is yes. Uh, I think it's, people, it's made people very aware of the value of green space um, and also multifunctional green space. So I think that people are now demanding uh, that that space isn't just a piece of amenity grassland uh, and with, with devoid, of, uh, devoid of anything, uh, you know, a, 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 it's great if you want to kick a football around, but it's not so great if you want to sit under a tree and read a book. Uh, it's not so great if you want to meet your your pal for a cup of coffee on a on a bench. So I think that those spaces are now being um, more valued, but the, the 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 function of that space I think is also being uh, not questioned, but the the how it operates I think is being now looked at in a lot more detail. The other thing I think is people are more aware of. Uh, the mental health associated with where they work um, and their space. Now, for lots of us in the lockdown, that area of work has been our uh, home office rather than the 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 um, you know the office the office. But we are demanding, I think, that when we do return to the office, that you know they, they have good natural daylight or good ventilation, or there is connection with uh, biophilia or, or, or greenery in the office. So I do think there's a huge amount of refocusing on well, physical well-being and mental well-being in the places that we work, places that we play, and the places that we um, interact in. So do you think that there, there, there will be more opportunities 
to work with mental health workers or psychologists in your projects? I, I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Um, and I do think that we will. Um, uh, and I think that would be for two, two reasons. I think that, that the people that, that... So there's a range of stakeholders that we um, engage with. Some of those are kind of regulatory, like the planning process. And some of those are um, kind of more community and people focused. So I think both the regulatory and the community people outside of the stakeholder um, engagement process are looking for proper evidence and more input. Uh, um, and developers want to know that the, if they build it, it will provide that function, particularly where we're having to go back and monitor it and in some instances, the performance of those interventions are being linked to a financial payment. So if it doesn't perform in the way it's been designed, there's a penalty or a payment to be had. Um, and so I think that, that everybody that's engaged in this space really wants to have a good evidence base and reliable uh, mechanisms to ensure that what's been designed actually delivers that betterment. Thank you very much. Um, Holly has a question um, ab uh, about the paranoia and mental health study. So Carrie and Yi, uh, would you what would you say was the limitation of conducting your study, and how would you change this if you had to repeat the study again? Uh, I don't know if Yi is here, uh, but I'll take that quickly. We definitely have a lot of limitations, as with <laughs> most research studies. Uh, I, I almost feel like there's not one perfect study out there, right? Um, I guess a key one would be that um, our sample, our sample, it's convenient sample, it's convenient sampling. So, um, you know, the people who happen to have access to our study link, they were able to participate. Um, most of these uh, individuals in our study, as you saw uh, when I introduced the demographics of them, they were pretty affluent. Um, and, you know, to a large extent, we can't really really generalize uh, these findings to uh, the you know, population that we know of um, be simply because it's not a representative sample. So that would be a key, I guess, limitation in terms of the uh, sample size. Um, but that said, um, I think many of our participants who do take part in the study, given how many of them continue to support us in the, in the study, uh, it shows that they really do wanna tell us uh, what, what, what's going on and how things are changing um, and the impacts of COVID on their lives as well. So um, these are very eager participants, I would say. Um, and you know, one, one thing that researchers often think about is whether or not responses or survey responses are valid, um, whether they're measuring what they're, what they're intended to measure. Um, and I would say you know, for a longitudinal study, uh, there will be attrition as expected, but those who continue to support and, and continue to fill out the survey do end up um, giving us very kind of valid um, uh, experiences and responses. So uh, yeah, I think th those are the two main, uh, the main one that I can think of. Wang, Wang Yi, what do you think? Uh, yes, I agree. So the, I think it's, it's already a nice, a very nice study, a designed, a very nice design study actually. And uh, uh, now, as I know, there are some online um, experiments like we, we may uh, want to think about if we have to have a chance to repeat it. Yeah. Great. And before we take another question, I'm going to use this opportunity to just launch a quick feedback poll because we are coming to the end of, of the session. But for those of you who are still eager to ask questions, do throw those questions in the, in the chat. I'm um, going to quickly uh, launch this poll, um, and this will really help us understand, you know, how this talk may uh, have changed your ideas of paranoia or your understanding, um, and also whether or not simply whether you enjoyed it or, or not. Um, we still have three more sessions in the series, so we're looking to constantly improve um, and avoid Zoom bombs as well. So put that in there in, in the note as well. So thank you very much. And do continue to post questions as well. Um, as maybe Evie, there is, is there another question? Yeah, there is. Great. So, um, okay. Um, so the question is, 
um, curiosity about the potential, the role of rationalization in perceived loneliness. Do you think that having good reasons for being lonely might influence the outcomes of perceived loneliness? For example, in the pandemic, some governments pushed the narrative that the loneliness was a necessary sacrifice. And for individuals with high schizotypic schizotypal traits, if they justify the loneliness by assuming it's safer alternative than meeting with people who are out to prosecute them. Would that influence their outcomes? That's the question. So um, I think that's a great question. I think uh, Emma, are you <laughs> are you here still? It's an interesting question. Um, so one of the interesting things about human beings is that we, whether we know it or not, we all have a story. We tell ourselves about ourselves all of the time. So without even realizing it, we have rationalizations for most of our behavior, just as something we do day to day. It's part of how we maintain our sense of self and a sense of being connected to who we are. Sometimes those stories and narratives can be useful and sometimes they can be less useful. So potentially what you're talking about there would be a narrative that might be useful in the short term in that somebody may be able to find a way through or live with their current levels of loneliness. But if it's something that goes on for a long period of time, let's say, for example, when social distancing measures ease and they are able to go out, but they choose not to, that narrative will then be less helpful for their long term psychological well being. So I guess what I, in a roundabout sort of way, what I'm explaining is that. These rationalization processes can be helpful to some extent, but we need them to be flexible. Mm -hmm. And in, particularly in response to what's going around on around us in our environment, we need to show that we can change and adapt. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, and uh, we have one more question I think we'll manage to squeeze before we close this webinar. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is um, whether people have been affected by whether their home is well connected without using public transport, since that could be perceived as risky, has affected how they are doing. For example, I imagine if you have a car, then that would be a benefit exacerbating socioeconomic background influences. Uh, I think, Mitch, is it you who will take that one? Uh, I think the short answer to that is I imagine it, it has. Uh, I think the, the data would back that up. Um, obviously, uh, from my my point of view, uh, you know, the, the, the people that are most likely not to have cars are those people that are more likely to be affected um, in that uh, in in the COVID pandemic and, and consider themselves to be more at risk. But I don't know, Kerry, and whether you, you know you're the you're the real scientist uh, 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 in this. Do you, would, you, feel, would you show that in the, in the data? Yeah, I feel that's a really great question, Stephanie. And Stephanie's a friend, so I know I can say this. <laughs> but I almost feel like your question kind of uh, bridges both of you know the design aspects and also the you know in the home what's going on and how people are, are feeling um we unfortunately as i was reading your question we unfortunately don't have data on whether people um you know have a car or have access to public transport that kind of thing or how near they are um originally at the start of our when we were designing this study we did think whether or not we should be collecting data on kind of gps location so getting getting a location um, um, of where people are, but um, due to GDPR reasons, we did not do that. Um, and so unfortunately, we don't have actual, you know, actual locations of where people are, and then also how they're feeling in respects to um, access to public transport. So uh, fantastic question. I don't have the data for it, but it sounds like a project that Mitch and I and other, <laughs> other psychologists could get on board with in uh, understanding this, this uh, issue a bit more. Thanks for the question. 
Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, I don't see any further questions. Uh, we have put on the chat the upcoming webinars, which will be interesting, and please do follow. Um, I think I'd like to ask uh, uh, the people in the panel to leave us with one message. So one message, one uh, highlight uh, from today, from your research experience and everything. Um, who would like to go first? I think my uh, message would be, um, I think this is the way that, that, that practitioners need to come together to understand how actually we can design something to, to rather than just design something for the, for the sake of designing it, we need to make sure that the design and the interventions are intelligent and actually are in the right location. I don't know how many times I've been, you know, previously been in design team meetings or working with um, developers who thought by putting a skateboard park or a couple of bouncy chickens in a, a playground, that was their, you know, that was what they were delivering from a social value point of view. I think that we all need to be um, a bit more intelligent and make sure that, that we don't see any more bouncy chickens uh, or disused skate parks and actually we do something um, which is going to create true meaningful connections and interactions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mitch. I think that's a good message. Um, Emma? I think I would, the one line I would say is we should all talk to each other. We're all equally as scared and we're all equally as scared of each other, but we all have that in common. So let's take the risk and talk. Brilliant. Kerry? Yeah, uh, me, I think I'm a little biased, but uh, along the same lines of kind of interdisciplinary approaches, I think um, the fact that we don't talk enough with other people from other disciplines means that our whatever solution we come up with, it's always going to be limited. And this is the same for research as well. So kind of including the participants, including the people who um, we sh want to hear from is very important as well in thinking of these um, solutions. So yeah, that's my point. And one Yi? And very simple, just to get connected with your friends and uh, you know, talk to them. That's, I, I, I think it will help. Thank you very much to presenters. Thank you for giving up your time. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined us and to Kerry for organizing uh, everything. Uh, I hope you all have a lovely evening. Thank you so much.